Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining our webinar today. My name is Christine Burke, and I'm the B2B Marketing Director for Healthy Careers. I'm excited that you're taking the time to join us today. We had over 360 people sign up to hear from our esteemed panel, who will discuss the impact of the pandemic on their recruiting efforts and how they're looking forward this year. Let's start off by reviewing a few housekeeping items. First, this session is being recorded and will be emailed to you afterwards. We encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A button on the console. We will try to answer as many questions during today's live session as we can, but if we aren't able to get to your question, we'll follow up with more information after the webinar. Finally, we'll be trying to do two polls during the webinar and would love your participation. You should have a pop-up appear with the poll and a list of uh, answers to select from um, to participate. Thank you, Christine, and everyone for joining us today. My name is Joe Cordo, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I am a senior account executive at Healthy Careers. I've been with the company since 2008. I live in beautiful Denver, Colorado, and my wife with my wife and three kids. I'd like to take the time to introduce our fantastic guest speakers. First up is Michelle Seifert. Michelle is currently the director for the Office of Physician Recruitment at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. She co-founded the department in 2001, experienced director who has demonstrated a history of working in the hospital and healthcare industry. Skilled in healthcare consulting, recruitment, practice acquisition, and a financial analyst. Strong human resource professional with a BBA focus in accounting from Cleveland State University. In prior years, she has served as a board member, the treasurer at AAPPR, as well as several other committees. She is also certified by AAPPR as a physician provider recruitment professional. She lives in Mentor, Ohio with her husband of over 30 years and two adult children. Thank you for being here, Michelle. Next up, Ginny Olson. Ginny, who has worked at Cayuga Health System in upstate New York, upstate New York for the past 15 years, where she acts as the key hospital and community resource for recruiting physicians and other key medical personnel, such as NPs and PAs. Thank you for being here as well, Jenny. Rounding out our guest speaker panel is Amber Green. Amber is out of Atlanta, Georgia, where she is the sourcing recruiter for Piedmont Healthcare's physician enterprise team. With over six years of experience, she is known for her professionalism, dedication, and passionate rapport with candidates and the recruitment team. With a consultative approach, she attracts physicians and APP professionals to join their growing hospital system. With a broad knowledge in multiple specialties, Amber understands the importance of searching, vetting, and pairing elite candidates to their various medical teams. She also believes and understands that everyone should be happy and productive in the workplace and relies on the desired culture of candidates that match the Piedmont's promise to make a positive difference in every life they touch. Thank you again for joining us and thank you for all the attendees on the call. Today, we will be discussing the impact that COVID-19 has had on recruitment in 2020 and moving forward. Let's dive right on in. What was the direct impact COVID-19 had to departments and your recruitment efforts? AAPPR, the Association for Advancing Physician and Provider Recruitment has reported that 62% of their polled members were expected to reduce their advertising spend and that 38% of the members even paused recruitment at one point in 2020. I'm sure we can all agree that 2020 was a very challenging year. Professionally, everyone had to learn to work remotely, adapt to new software platforms, and even in some cases, complete reorganizations of entire systems and departments. We all know that healthcare, the healthcare industry is notoriously slow on adapting and embracing change. But look how far we've come. These changes could not have happened without your dedication and hard work. The graph above represents the change in job postings and applies that Healthy Career saw 
from 2019 to 2020. As you can see in March, 2020, everyone started to pivot and plan as the pandemic started to hit a home for everyone. As uncertainty started to grow for all of us, so did the future of providers and their careers. As organizations started to pull back on the number of openings being offered, the market started to increase on the number of seekers looking for new opportunities. Employers that were able to continue their recruitment efforts reported as having, high, as having one of their best placement years ever. Despite the environment, healthy careers saw a 21% increase in traffic and a 13% increase in applies compared to 2019. With fewer openings being offered and a record number of seekers looking is what helped drive increased exposure for job opportunities. Even with the overall reduction in recruitment efforts, certain specialties remain top priority for recruiters. Between AAPPR and healthy careers, we identified these specialties as top priority year over year for the second half of 2020 versus 2019. According to AAPPR, the specialties on the left remain top priorities. While the list on the right are the main specialties, healthy careers saw with the biggest increase of number of jobs being posted. Last year, recruiting switched to be virtual and we all had to adapt to new remote, remote work environments. Healthy Careers also went virtual by hosting 14 virtual career fairs with the association partners. These events gave recruiters a way to connect one-on-one -on -one with job seekers with registrations ranging from 200 to 700 seekers per event. As nearly, at nearly every job seeker attendance far exceeded in-person events. This portion wraps up of what we saw in 2020. Now let's move on to the seekers or to the speakers and we'd also love to hear your feedback as well. Here is our first poll question for everyone. What are your top challenges last year? What were your top challenges last year? While you're all taking the poll, let's hear from our speakers and see what their top challenges are. Michelle, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, our top challenges here at the Cleveland Clinic um, basically was putting our team working remotely um, and keeping our team engaged throughout the year um, and leading through the change. Um, I would say the second top challenge was the candidate virtual interviews and making sure that that was all taken care of um, and making sure our candidates were engaged. We actually had candidates that have accepted positions without ever having to come to Cleveland. So those are our top two. Sure, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Jenny? I would say our top challenges were navig navigating the interview process. In upstate New York, we had an awful issue with trying to be in um, alignment with what the government and what the state wanted us to do. Sure. And so it was difficult to stay ahead of testing people, vaccinations, um, making sure we had the proper uh, issues in order for when people would interview. Uh, that was one of the top ones. And then, although we had a lot of candidates and we had the ability to interview, it seemed to me this year we had to move quicker. Um, we moved to Zoom quickly for meetings, but it was very apparent that interview in person was still a priority for us. Sure. But um, we had to move quicker with candidates than we ever had before. Well, great insight. I, I Thank you so much. Um, Amber? Yeah, so I'd say um, kind of going off of Jenny and Michelle is navigating a new uh, remote system in regards to interviewing, but as well uh, with us dealing with our budget cuts to make sure that we would be able to fit around and restructure our team and our physicians where the need and the top challenges were in each service line. So to make a long answer short, that's pretty much it. Well, perfect. 
Well, let's see what the group had to say. Wow, 64% adapting to new recruiting and interviewing processes, 64%. Um, well, yeah, and yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for everyone taking the poll. Our next question is for Jenny. How does your recruiting strategy differ now from last year and pre-pandemic? Again, I would think, I would say the, the biggest difference for us is that we had to move quickly. We did have uh, an abundance of candidates and we were poised early on and we're very aware that um, there were less job opportunities. Uh, so one of the strategies we took was to do more marketing efforts up front for those open positions, but um, making sure that we were moving faster and uh, making sure that we did um, in, in, before the in-person, we would do Zoom meetings and then we would pre-qualify the candidates a little bit more readily so that when it came time to do our in-persons, um, it was basically just the sealing the deal. Well, that's fantastic. That, that's great. Um, I appreciate you sharing. Um, also, as a group, remind, uh, as a reminder, please feel free to submit questions using that Q&A function on the console, um, as we, and we will try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Our next poll question, how many positions are you looking to fill this year? Michelle, as the, as the group is finishing up and taking that poll, we would like to ask you, what are uh, some of your top initiatives this year at Cleveland Clinic? Right, so our top initiatives this year, um, one of them is uh, making a professional and personal enriching work environment for our team. And again, as I mentioned previously, our workforce engagement is super important. Um, Another top initiative is enhancing our ethnic and gender diversity for all of our providers, sure. staff, um, APP leadership levels. So we have a huge diversity and inclusion um, uh, program that we're doing. Uh, we're also standardizing our enterprise provider recruitment by identifying and adopting universal best practices. So we're putting that all together. Um, we're enhancing our efforts for staff recruitment and trainee retention. So we have a huge resident and fellow initiative here. We took that uh, virtual now. So we are meeting with all our residents and fellows. We put on programs twice a year in the fall and the spring for all the trainees. Um, we're utilizing social media technology in a different manner. We're uh, using LinkedIn, Brazen. Um, one of our biggest initiatives this year too is to redu reduce the time to fill for our APP recruitment. Um, we wanna reduce to 65 days or less. Wow. Um, we're actually increasing the number of physician recruits that we're doing. So we're using new tools, like I said, Brazen, LinkedIn. Um, we're also demonstrating the revenue impacts of an efficient and effective recruitment department. Um, so we have a lot of initiatives on our plate and we're hoping to work through these. We are working more efficiently, so. Well, fantastic. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing. You got a lot going on over there in Cleveland Clinic uh, mm -hmm. this year. Best of luck to all the changes. Um, what, what are the uh, poll results that we're showing, Christina? Okay, so we're looking at right about 51 to 100 um, seems to be the lead this uh, for this year. As we move on, this next question is for Amber. Has your focus from a specialty perspective shifted this year? Um, I'd say it's a twofold answer. It's like yes and no, because with the previous slide saying that the um, top uh, positions or specialties were needed, it's still kind of the, a little bit. Um, so you have your need for your family medicine, internal and um, uh, pulmonary critical care. Those are always a high need. Um, and even though with COVID, everything has kind of warped um, things around, you have some of your specialties and some of your docs being shifted and diverted for um, other needs. So in a sense, no, that part, but then yes, because now we have our psychiatry specialties coming up because of lockdowns and people going through 
those kind of um, um, difficulties. And then you have your other um, uh, specialties as far as uh, surgical or even for cancer, like uh, oncology. So it kind of shifted in the way of what I needed to look for at a time where I didn't normally look for it. So if you have a specialty that you looked for at the beginning of the year, now it's shifted towards the end of the year because it's everything is kind of warped now. People were kind of staying in place. So you just kind of needed to roll with it and see what you could get from everybody at that particular moment in the year. So I would say then yes, yes and no, it has shifted <laughs> because everybody's need has shifted. Wow, well that, that, that's, that's great insight. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing. For sure. Um, the next question we have is for all of our speakers. Um, what personal advice do you have for other recruiters who maybe are going through some difficult times or changes? Uh, Michelle, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I guess my personal advice is to continue to work hard, uh, patience and perseverance, um, make yourself invaluable, stay connected with your other recruiters mm -hmm. and your team, team members, and invest in your own development and training. Uh, this is a good time. We're working more efficiently where we can now, we're taking some classes. Um, the clinic has a huge global learning academy. So we're able to take those classes um, and enrich our personal development. Oh, fantastic. Those are all really, really good suggestions. Uh, thank, thank you for sharing. Um, Jenny? I would like to say um, wait 24 hours because the <laughs> landscape seems to change. And I think we're all finding that in healthcare uh, at an extreme point right now that things are changing, our roles are changing, we're adapting to new methods, new process. Yeah, I, it seems like we're always getting a curveball amid COVID. Um, <laughs> one, one of the things that I've, I've tried to adapt and I know our group and our CEO often says is um, when you start to see things that are disappointing, try and, or things that are changing in a way that, that you're not necessarily fond of or your roles adapting, um, look at it and say, um, instead of a negative, what, 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 can I, what can I do to make this better? How can I turn this negative into a positive? Sure. Um, sometimes just looking at it from a different perspective can give you a little insight and you can adapt a little bit better. That, that's, that's fantastic advice. Um, I'm gonna take advantage of the wait 24 hours uh, uh, suggestion there. <laughs> um, Amber. That is a good uh, suggestion. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna write that one down, put on, <laughs> post a note on my computer up here. Right. <laughs> so my main motto, not only in work life, but in my personal life, I'd say this to my coworkers all the time, is control what you can control. Um, it doesn't help anyone when you are, um, what they say, run, running around like a chicken with their head cut off. Just get to the point of what you can do and go from there. Because at the end of the day, we have more control over our situation than we realize. So we're able to actually complete and finish things that we didn't think would, we would be able to, to complete. We're subject matter experts in our field in recruiting. We know what we can do. We know that we can find a unicorn. We know we can find a purple squirrel. We know we can <laughs> fit a square in a circular you know, hole. We know we can do all these things. So just make sure you control what you can control. Keep the stability to Michelle's point. Stay positive, stay the course. Just keep doing what you know that you can do and everything will fall into place. And you'll be like, I'm not sure how that happened but it did, I'm excited. Now let's move on to the next thing. So that's my advice is that it's been extremely difficult, but I just keep telling myself, control what I can't control. I can't, sure. This none of this was anybody's fault. There's nothing that we can do, but just work with the lemons that we were given to make some tasty lemonade. So <laughs> uh, luckily for me and my team, it was easier for us to um, transition to remote work because we all work from home anyways. Um, so it was a little bit easier. It was just the, the uh, Zoom interviews and 
doing all of that change. But yeah, just control what you can control, you guys. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, we're all in it together, aren't we? Yep, for, for sure. sure. Perfect. Okay. Um, those are all the questions that I have for the webinar. Um, if we want to turn it back over to Christine uh, for any additional Q&A. Yes, thank you to everyone who has been submitting questions. Uh, just a reminder that you can use the Q&A button to submit questions. We have uh, ample time right now to answer your questions and make sure that you're getting the most use out of your time joining us today. So go ahead and submit questions. Um, the first one I want to start with, and we had two people actually ask this, is how are you continuing to have recruitment teams work remotely or are you considering adapting your structure to increase remote work? Um, and I know that Jenny answered in the chat, but if we could um, hear from some other people as well. Right, so the team at the Cleveland Clinic, we have about 20 recruiters on the team. We're still working remotely from home. Um, we are starting to go down to our main campus. Um, depends on, um, what needs to be done and what type of candidate it is, but we are transitioning to a hybrid model. So we're gonna be working three, three days from home and perhaps two days um, in the office. So we'll have some hotel spacing around Northeast Ohio, whether it's at our main campus or one of our regional sites. So, um, and then again, if we're gonna to get together as a group, we'll need group space. So we're working on all of that as well. Perfect. Um, Amber, do you have any uh, additional insight on uh, what Piedmont's doing for um, working from home or transitioning or hybrid or anything along those lines? Yeah, so um, uh, like I stated in my last answer, we already work from home. So um, uh, when I joined the team, they were 100% remote. Some people go into the office one to two days a week. I usually try to go one, two days a week just to, you know, get the feel of you know, coworkers and being there. Um, our recruiters though are extremely busy with site visits with their physicians. So that's the main part that they are in the hospitals working. So a lot of times they actually work on site at one of our 11 hospitals, um, but the, um, the remote work wasn't really a hard ch or a challenging change for us because it was a, a daily um, occurrence. Um, gotcha over the years, uh, but just adapting to the structure in regards to Zoom <laughs> interviews has been quite interesting and fun. <laughs> Always new challenges. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, a great question. What's next up on the list, Christine? Speaking of challenges, after a year of doing virtual interviews, what are some tips that you have to make the best um, candidate and team experience for people you're interviewing? Good question. I would say um, come with the questions that you want to ask. Make sure you have it outlined so there's not, in journalism, they call it, in broadcast journalism, they call it dead air, so that there's no dead air or any awkwardness. Um, so just kind of, of course, small talk could be difficult for some, but even if you feel comfortable through that screen to them, they'll in turn give you that same energy. Um, and then just making sure you have what it is that you, you need to do um, or you need to ask them. Um, sometimes even practicing it helps uh, to make sure that you fill up that time so they don't feel as though um, it was a five minute you know interview over Zoom or something and um, they're like, oh, that could have been a phone call. So yeah, <laughs> that part. Perfect. Ginny or Michelle, any, any uh, additional insights you'd like to share on uh, tips and tricks for virtual interviews? Well, for, for us, we're using Zoom interviews for, again, our, our initial. And um, we start to dive into a little bit more of what the physician or the provider will need for their practice, what they're looking for their practice uh, in terms of equipment, in terms of procedures they want to do. Uh, we're trying to get all that information up front so that when they come for the interview, um, again, it's more like sealing the deal and just having a lot more specifics up front to answer. Um, so we, we generally will uh, take a list of questions that are 
specific to the, the service or the specialty and make sure that we're getting all those answered via Zoom. Perfect. Right, so we're doing virtual interviews for the first visits for our candidates. So it's nice, um, it's actually, we're able to schedule more people for first interviews because before when you were trying to schedule site visits and try to get your staff, everybody on the same day, we're able to split these days. Um, so we do have, you know, the ability to, to spread it out, to get our candidates through faster or quicker. Um, we do it through MS Teams is our platform that we use. Mm -hmm. And again, we, we do our benefit presentations on the first visit or first virtual visit, and then candidates that um, are comfortable with coming and touring and meeting in person, we're setting up those second interviews face-to-face. -face. Perfect, fantastic. A um, lot of good questions, let's keep them coming. Yes, what's, so uh, many questions. <laughs> so the next question is around, do you source passive candidates? And if so, what are some tips that you have to do this effectively? We do source passive candidates for physicians as well as the APP um, service lines. And we just started using LinkedIn. We're doing a trial basis. Um, we found that to be effective. We're in our second month of it. Um, we also use our applicant tracking system. We're able to do um, email campaigns through that system as well and do you know reach out to some passive candidates. Perfect. Okay. Um, Can you another question again. I'm, I'm it was, good. do you source passive candidates? Oh. And if so, what tips do you have? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> the, the tip is just to keep their information and check in with them. What I do, um, because I used to be in um, agency recruitment, so um, you would follow up with them every 30 days. Um, so, it, but if you have an immediate need, try just fill them out when you talk to them. Um, after the first conversation, they're like, oh, not really, you know, check back with me in like two months. And you're like, okay, I'll check back with you in 30 days. Um, if you could get it to like three weeks, two weeks, do that. But even just, um, I would say the, a big tip that was very successful for me is um, saving their phone, their number and your work phone, if you have one, and just texting them, hey, I'm just checking in to see how you're doing. If you were able to talk to them for an extended period of time about their family, how's your family, how's everything, how was your vacation, just keeping that um, small little thread of, um, of connection um, alive will definitely help in the future. Perfect. Going on the thread of kind of best practices, we had someone submit a question asking, do you recommend any training programs to help with recruitment efforts um, for your staff or for yourself that you've taken that you think is worth sharing? Okay, nobody's gonna take, I'll jump in, this is Michelle. <laughs> I mean, um, so I, I'm a member of AAPPR. I would highly recommend any new recruiters joining that group. And also I know Jenny is the leader of her group in her um, area in New York. So yeah, networking with your fellow recruiters throughout the country. Um, they have a lot of educational programs. They have a lot of um, information on their website too. So, and they also have a great chat. Absolutely. It's funny, Michelle, I was just gonna say that as, as you were starting, you know, AAPBR has some great um, uh, offerings for education on many levels. But on a regional level, it's also nice to work with in um, a subset that uh, have similar rules and regulations and know the market area. Um, I find your fellow recruiter, are they're usually very helpful. So the regionals are really nice as well. Absolutely. We have another question um, around what are some tools that you use in your day-to-day -day work that help you be the most productive? I, I have one thing that I started doing just this past year and some days I'm really good at it and some days not so much, but I've started to answer my emails at either the beginning and or the end of the day and try to use the middle for 
higher level projects and productivity. I found that I was wasting a lot of time um, responding to emails and getting caught in uh, a spider web, so to speak, and not getting the projects done that needed to be done that were higher level. And so um, mm -hmm. I think trying to limit the amount that you're responding to emails is a good way to keep on task. Oh, that's a good suggestion. Yeah, that's good. So what I do, I can answer this. Sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay cool. um, so what I do, because I do a lot of sourcing, a lot, a lot of recruiting um, to help out my uh, uh, recruitment team. So what I've done over the past uh, six plus years that I've been recruiting is each position that I'm working or specialty that I'm working, I work on it straight for 45 minutes. 45 minutes of calling, emailing, following up with candidates to see where they're at, if they're interested, how's this, how's this location. Just focus specifically on that specialty. So if I'm doing oncology, I'm doing it from eight to nine. And then that 15 minutes at the end, I get up, stretch my legs, get some water, get my mind right, go outside, pet my dog, go back and then go to the next specialty. So that's something that helps me stay on track um, with um, what I need to do and to check everything off of my list throughout the day. Um, I also put it on my calendar so my team knows, hey, during this time, I'm unavailable because I'm helping to source for your position that you need 12 candidates for, right? Um, so that in turn helps um, my team know that, hey, I'm busy working on helping the team succeed and in turn helping Piedmont um, deliver the um, docs that they need to stay on our successful path. So um, I would just say, you know, making sure that you're staying on the time that you need. That's what, that's the tool that helps me. Sure. I, you know, I, I do that as well, just real quick. I, I love blocking off calendar time. If you have a project you need to get done, if there's something that's pressing, is blocking that off on my calendar so people are not um, scheduling things. They see that I'm unavailable, so you can really focus on that. So great, great insight, Amber. Um, and also uh, related to time, I'm sure a lot of people are dealing with this as well in the call. Um, you know, working from home, you could feel like you never stop working and are working 12 plus hour days or the, working on the weekends. Are people feeling this as well and dealing with this as well? And what advice do you have to unplug? Yeah, I was gonna say a good thing to do is to have a dedicated space in your home. So you have your office, maybe a wait, you're not working in the kitchen or in the living room. So you can actually have your workspace separate from your living area. Um, I know when I work in the kitchen or on the counter, um, I'm constantly working into the evenings, checking emails and things like that. But if I actually put my computer and laptop in, in my office, I, I can actually, I, I can se separate the two. Um, not to say that you're not answering emails in the evening, but I feel like I work more if I'm, I'm in the common area. Um, I also put on my calendar too, like at noon to go for a walk or, or walk around the block, listen to a podcast. So I find taking a break from the laptop because if you're just sitting there 12 hours a day in front of the screen, um, it's, you're just going to get burned out. I kind of do the same thing. I feel like I keep jumping in, but I'm so excited that, to answer this <laughs> one. <laughs> so it, I kind of do the same thing where I, okay, I have two small kids. They're one and four. So when my four-year-old told me after I picked them up from daycare and school, oh, mommy's still working, Isaiah. She'll be with us in a minute. I was like, oh my gosh, that broke my heart because it was like, seven o'clock you know I should be reading with them a bedtime story and put it in the bed or playing with them or something like that so it kind of broke my heart so what I do at 5 30 every day I close my laptop I don't turn off my work phone because you know you never know what might happen but I put everything in my backpack in my work backpack so that I don't have to open it up it's a hassle to open it up turn it on unravel the cord to plug it in I don't want to do all that so as long as I put it in the backpack and walk away, then I'm good to go. Out of sight, yeah. out of mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great tip. Thank you, Amber. Yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, we had some questions around, um, are you planning 
for specific sourcing changes and needs looking forward to next year and the year after when kind of the pandemic has ended. And I think this kind of goes along with that. Have you seen any trends in the market around specialties of, as far as seeing greater needs now? Are you planning for greater needs in the future? Do you, do you want to jump in? <laughs> yes, uh, we are planning on doing a, a bit more marketing. Uh, we all, of course, are, and I think this goes to the the recruiter being, you know, really engaged and personal. We are all desperately missing uh, in person career fairs, and our hope, obviously, is that they will be back at the end of this year or early next. Um, and while we're doing some of the Zoom and, and virtual fairs, um, they seem to just not hold the same relevance for us or uh, oomph, as, as I like to say. So we've decided to, um, instead of marketing on just one level at, at, at um, uh, job postings, we're trying to be multifaceted in that we're using different job placement boards and just trying to switch it up a bit. Just when we think we know the recipe, we try and use something different just to see what kind of traction we'll get. Perfect. Thank you. Michelle or Amber? Um, sure. Um, so we have um, a supply and demand is issue kind of in our APP recruitment where we actually have our supply of candidate exceeds our opportunities. So it sounds like a good problem, but it does allow us to be more selective. Um, but it's also a problem when we're trying to retain our own new graduates. So we have a high percentage of employed RNs who become NPs and they're having a difficult time since we're, we have more qualified experience applicants applying. So they're, we're focusing more on our career services and we're working with our graduate NPs, you know, um, giving them advice on their CVs and their cover letters and interviewing skills. We also have a huge resident and fellow initiative here at the clinic, which we do with all of our residents and fellows. So we're working on additional screening options to assist on identifying our top candidates. I guess we're being more selective, but I guess it, it sounds like a good problem, but, um, we're having sure, more sure. candidates. Perfect, thank you. I want that hey. problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, well, it's funny, Michelle, I'm so glad you said that because I didn't think of it from that perspective. And we too are say, having the same issue. And you're absolutely right. It's difficult when we have so many that are in-house that we've, we've grown and we wanna hire and we don't have enough positions. So while we're still looking for a lot of physician positions, our APP numbers have, have dropped in roles. Mm, okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so we had a question come in earlier that was around how do you deal with needing to hire for a role that where the candidate pool is actually really small. So you guys are talking about having uh, an abundance of, of applicants, but what do you, what tips do you have for someone who's dealing with the opposite situation? So I have that situation currently with at least five specialties, um, mainly our uh, primary care and cardiology positions. We have multiple um, openings, but just not enough in the candidate pool. Um, so I've tried every avenue from different um, platforms, um, even uh, signing up to every alumni group in the Southeast that I possibly could to see if I could get any kind of fellows or anything. Um, so that is kind of giving me a little bit more traction under my feet. Um, so I would say um, that to start off, um, if you are having the same issue as me, um, but I'm still working through it to see where it's going to take me. Um, we have started hiring a little bit more of some agencies, um, some recruitment firms. Um, they hired me so that they wouldn't have to do that that much, but I was like, hey, you guys might have to go back. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm still working through that. So yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've done the specialty uh, specific career fairs at Healthy Careers is when you do have those specific needs and you're able to get, you know, either chat with them during the event or the full lists afterwards, 
um, when you have those real hard to fill pressing needs um, mm -hmm. to have those really uh, specialty specific events. So yeah. we're, we're trying to do what we can here to help alleviate that problem as well. I think one of the things we have done too um, is when we have it, of course, it depends on how big your uh, healthcare system is and the numbers you're looking for. But within special specialty departments, um, we, for our physicians, we have a physician survey that we utilize for every new incoming physician and for our current medical staff that asks if they will be involved in recruitment. Um, and it goes through a whole list of uh, personal details and things that they want to share and how engaged they want to be. But it's a nice resource that we've set up in a database that we can kind of match candidates so that when we start to go and look you know, for somebody right out of training, we can we can look for specialists in that category already and ask them to engage. But I mean, as recruiters, we know um, people coming from residency programs and fellowships. You, if you tag in and engage them in recruitment in the first three to five years, they have a lot of contacts that they can give. Sure. Yeah. I I think we have time for about one more question, maybe. I believe, Christine. Yes, and I think I'm going to try to make this a two for question. So we did have um, a question come in is, has anyone experienced an uptick in rural replacements? And I also think that this other question kind of goes along with it, which is, if you have candidates who have accepted offers without having visited the site, are you providing them information about the city, the campus? Um, how is that changing? And I think uh, for a lot of times from what I've heard is that when you're rural, recruiting rural, rurally, <laughs> you have to provide some of this additional information. So um, anyone who'd like to answer one of those. Well, you know, Christine, I'll answer the question regarding the visits, you know, for candidates that make, have never been to Cleveland um, and have accepted the position. Um, we do work with the local real estate agents. They'll do, they're doing virtual tours. And I think right now the national home market housing is crazy. The rates are low, but there's no houses or you're paying over what really the value of the home is. It's just a crazy market right now. So a lot of people are coming in and they're renting. So we're doing a lot of virtual visits. Our reload people are helping us do that. Um, they're going to homes, they're doing virtual visits in that regard, or they're finding them temporary housing and so settles down. Um, and then also um, I've set up like some FaceTime interviews with some of our staff. So they'll, their candidates will walk around the department with uh, FaceTime. Uh, but we do, we do try to get them here. Uh, it, it's hard if they've never been here. I'm going to say we've only recruited maybe one or two that have done that, but the majority do come at some point in time before, before that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, any other insight on, uh, on that two-part question from Ginny or Amber? Yeah, so I have had an uptick in rural um, locations, um, and those are the main ones that have been hard to fill, hard to find, uh, because I'm in Atlanta, so everybody wants to be in the metro Atlanta area. Um, anything 45 to an hour outside, they're like, mm, catch me next year. But um, I think that <laughs> what we try to do is to um, gen up our uh, rural areas and locations, especially if they're, you know, have a family and they're looking to settle down or they have friends and they just kind of want to visit, then we just kind of spruce up. I mean, the, they're, they're nice. The outside areas are nice. Um, they're just a little bit quieter. Um, so it's just trying to um, get through that. As far as site visits, um, everyone has a site visit. Um, I'm not aware of anybody that's accepted a job without a site visit here. Um, because like I said, it's Atlanta, so everybody wants to try to come and visit and see because everybody has a family member or a friend here. So, sure. um, but I just control what I can control. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I think that is about time or unless Jenny, if you wanted to chime no, in. Jenny wanted to chime in. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> we'll let her chime in. <laughs> the, the little bit on delay. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> We, we definitely have difficulty sometimes in upstate New York bringing people to 
out as, as Amber says, outside the city. So we try and dovetail with our, um, you know, our chamber of commerce and our local um, attributes that we have in the community. But we initially screen candidates and ask them what they're looking for. And rather than bombard them with all the information up front, we try and layer things in order of importance mm. to them. Sure. So sometimes, you know, sometimes family, sometimes school, sometimes housing, sometimes location. We try and tackle all the questions, but not all at once. And then we have a lot of good links and videos and things to share with them. But we try not to do it all at once because they won't look at it all. Gotcha. Absolutely. Great advice. So, wow, <laughs> that last 45 minutes flew by. Um, <laughs> we had so many questions and I'm sorry that we did, weren't able to get to every question, but we will be following up um, to try to get your questions answered. Uh, I wanted to thank our panelists for providing such amazing insight today. And they were kind enough to share their email addresses um, on this slide. If you'd like to follow up or connect with them personally, I, I believe they also are on LinkedIn if you prefer that. And um, thank you all to all of our amazing participants as well for participating in the polls, for joining and taking time out of your day today to be with us. Uh, again, stay tuned for a follow-up email that will include this recorded session um, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks. Thanks everyone, take care. Thanks, bye. Bye, thank you.